Thank you all for coming. We're very excited to have Evan Wiener here again today. He did a great program for us last year on 1968, 50 years later. Evan is a longtime sports journalist who's written columns in another number of newspapers, um, done radio programs and television at special appearance on sports topics as well. Thank you, Liz, and thanks for coming here today. Um, yeah, I've been around this business since 1971. I started when I was 15 years old. And uh, even though I'm talking mostly about the 1919 Chicago White Sox or Black Sox, I will also talk a little bit about Pete Rose. And I got to cover the Pete Rose, Bart Giamatti, Faye Vincent, John Dowd, betting scandal, Paul Janssen's, all of them. Um, that was back in 1989. And uh, also talk just a little bit about basketball scandals because uh, I knew Connie Hawkins, who was left out of the NBA until 1968, Roger Brown, who never played in the NBA, and yet both of them are in the Basketball Hall of Fame because they dealt with Jack Molinas, the um, gambler uh, and fixer. But uh, the Black Sox, it's the 100th anniversary of the throwing of the World Series. First World Series ever thrown, or was it? Hmm, maybe the 1918 World Series between the Cubs and Red Sox was also thrown. But before I get into all of that, baseball, professional baseball has been around since 1869 with the Cincinnati Reds, uh, Red Stockings as they were called back in those days. Lipman Pike was the first baseball player to get paid legally with the Philadelphia team in 1868. But um, there were scandals almost immediately. Now, the Black Sox is probably, with that and Pete Rose, the best known. The best of nine World Series featuring the White Sox and the Reds, Cincinnati Reds, was fixed. How it happened? Well, we think we know what happened. We know that some of the players met with some uh, gamblers. And all of a sudden, there was a promise. We'll give you this amount of money if you throw the World Series. Uh, there are various accounts of how that happened. We still don't know exactly 100 years later how that happened. It wasn't the first time that there was a fix. But the Chicago White Sox won 88 games that year. Uh, they were playing Cincinnati. Cincinnati was a good team, but the White Sox were favored. Now, everybody kind of knew that the World Series was fixed, but nobody did anything about it until 1920. A grand jury was seated for another fixed game during the 1920 season, and all of a sudden they stumbled upon, hey, the 1919 games were fixed. But it goes back. It goes back to the beginning of baseball. But here, here's the lineup. Chick Gendell, Eddie Sicotti, Shoeless Joe Jackson, Swede Reisberg and Buck Weaver, Lefty Williams, Fred McMullen, Hap Flesh, all of them tossed out of baseball. They weren't the first ever tossed out of baseball. Early days of baseball, there was crooked play. That was not uncommon. Gamblers came around. In fact, they undermined the National Association in the 1870s. The National League was formed with the intent of let's get rid of gambling. Now, uh, I'm sure you've heard of Tammany Hall, right? Tammany, who, who ran Tammany Hall? Who is that? Bosch Tweed. Well, Bosch Tweed was involved. Why wouldn't he be involved? He was the owner of the New York Mutuals in the 1860s, and that's where we find our first gambling. 1865. It involved the New York uh, Mutuals, which was owned by Bosch Tweed. Uh, there were three players, Thomas Deaver, William Wansley, and Edward Duffy. They all claimed that they were victimized, a wicked conspiracy. They were banned because allegedly they took $100 each to throw a game against the Eckfords of Brooklyn in Hoboken, New Jersey. Now, wait a minute. Why are, why are two New York teams playing in Hoboken? Elysian Fields. Eventually, the three of them would be reinstated. Uh, that's the first one. This guy, John Ratcliffe, he's the next guy who was caught. Uh, in 1874, he was thrown out of baseball. He offered an umpire $175. Uh, 
to help the Chicago White Stockings. The Chicago White Stockings. Hey, he was, uh, what, uh, 45 years early? Anyway, he offered um, the White Stockings $175 if he threw a game. Of course, he was gambling on the game. And then there's this guy, Bill Craver. He's part of the Louisville Grays. The Louisville Graves were, Grays, were the best team at that time. They had won seven in a row. They were leaving their league, the National League, and all of a sudden it was revealed that gamblers had bought off uh, Craver, uh, George Hall, Al Nichols, and Jim Devlin, the National League founder, William H. Holbert said, you're gone, you're out of here, banned from baseball. Now, the players claim that they only threw the games because they didn't get paid. Uh, their owner just stiffed them. They did beg for forgiveness, but were never reinstated. Now, the Grays franchise was gone after 1877, probably not because of the fix, probably because it was losing money. It lost $2,000. Uh, over the next few decades, there were all kinds of sus suspicions of game fixing in baseball, uh, including 1892. This guy, Dick Higham, he was a player who turned umpire, and the owner of the Detroit Wolverines at that time was William Thompson. And William Thompson became suspicious because all of a sudden there were all kinds of calls against his team. So he hires a detective to investigate what's going on, and then he finds out what's going on. Higgum was corresponding with a, a gambler, and he had a simple code. If the gambler received the telegram from him, Higgum, buy all the lumber you can, the gambler should bet on Detroit. If there was no telegram, then the gambler says, bet on your opponent. Lumber. Lumber is money. So that's 1882. And then there's this guy, the Hall of Famer, John J. McGraw. John J. McGraw was with the New York Giants. He was back with the Baltimore Orioles way back when, during uh, things when um, the Wee Willie, Wee Willie Keeler days, the, the Baltimore Chop. Do you ever hear the Baltimore Chop anymore in baseball? When did you hear it? Yeah, I know, but do you ever hear it these days? You never, that's one of those things that's disappeared from the lexicon. But uh, he was part of that. Now, McGraw uh, was the manager of the New York Giants in 1905. There was no World Series in 1904 because McGraw's Giants won the National League pennant, and they decided we're not going to face the American League, Ben Johnson's League. Uh, McGraw didn't like Ben Johnson because Ben Johnson, he thought, when he was in the American League, didn't treat them well. Anyway, so 1905, Giants win the National League pennant again, and McGraw bets $400 on his team to win. Uh, he held out in 1904 against Boston. Uh, Johnson had suspended McGraw for on-field behavior while he was in the American League. Now think of this, the manager of the New York Giants bet $400 on the game, which I think in today's money would be roughly $25,000, uh, $400 to bet on his team. Would he last today, or would he have been tossed? Well, he wasn't tossed, it was fine. Uh, 1908, the Giants team doctor, the Giants team doctor, tried to bribe another player so the Giants would win a game. The team doctor, team doctor didn't lose his license, but was thrown out of baseball in 1908. Uh, McGraw agreed to take on the Philadelphia A's. The Giants beat the A's in five games. McGraw got his money. He was not thrown out of baseball for betting. He survived. In fact, it wasn't even brought up very much. Now, Jack O'Connor, he's the manager of the St. Louis Americans. And he drinks Coca-Cola. <laughs> Ty Cobb drank Coca-Cola. Ty Cobb had stock in Coca-Cola. But no wonder he likes Coca-Cola. He liked Coca-Cola. He liked Coca-Cola full of vim, vigor, and go. You'll like it. Delicious, refreshing, thirst quenching. Anyway, Jack O'Connor and this guy, Harry Hell. Tossed out of baseball permanently. Uh, they were involved in, uh, they were, O'Connor was the manager, Hal the coach, and they tried to fix the outcome of a game. Uh, not necessarily the game, but they wanted to make sure that uh, Nap Lejoy, 
of the Cleveland Indians beat Ty Cobb in the batting race. So there were a number of things that were done. Um, Harry Howell ordered his third baseman to play back, allowing Lejoe, and remember this is the dead ball era, to bunt up the third base line for hit after hit after hit. Um, O'Connor and Hal also tried to bribe the official scorer, who was a woman. I never met a woman an official scorer in all the years I was around baseball. Now there are, but when I was covering baseball in the 70s, 80s, into the 90s, there was no official scorer. But anyway, they tried to bribe the official scorer, a woman, change one of the errors to a hit. And by doing, and how'd they do it? Let's buy her a new wardrobe. We'll buy her clothes. For that, they were thrown out of baseball. Now, here's Arthur Rothstein, the brain, right? The guy who made a business out of organized crime. He organized everything, which is why it's called organized crime. He was the brain. He was the master. He was the guy who figured out how to legitimize, how to make a legit, illegitimate business a business. Of course, he made all of his money on Prohibition, which also started in 1919, but really has nothing to do with the uh, White Sox. That's Charles Comiskey. Comiskey was the owner of the White Sox, a former player uh, who had a ballpark named after him, Comiskey Park. And here's the scheme. Chuck Gandel meets with Scott, uh, Sports Sullivan to discuss the possibility in September of 1919 of the Sox players throwing the championship. Now, it has been known, or was known, and I've given you 40 years worth of history, even more so than 40 years, that gamblers and baseball players knew each other, and that if you got the right baseball player, you might be able to throw a game. Um, all you had to do is come up with some cash. These guys were not making very much money. In fact, remember Babe Ruth in 1932? Somebody asked Babe Ruth in 1932, hey, you make more money than the president of the United States. He said, what the hell has this got to do with it? He said, besides, I had a better year than Hoover. <laughs> so anyway, gamblers could get tips from players who's injured, who might be on the take, who's not feeling well. Uh, Gandel later claimed he wasn't sure that this thing could really work. Uh, but he managed to get a hold of a couple of people, uh, co-conspirators, and they said, OK, we'll throw the World Series. You throw $100,000 our way, and everything will be fine. So he gets the players, Eddie Sicotti, Claude Lefty Williams, uh, Charles Swede Risberg, Happy Felsch. Buck Weaver was involved in the early stages of the plot, but he pulled out. Fred McMullen was cut in after he heard the other players go ahead with the gamblers. And shoeless Joe Jackson was approached. Now, it's hard, still after all these years, it's still hard to get evidence that shoeless Joe Jackson was ever really involved with Sports Sullivan. He was supposedly involved with Sports Sullivan. He was also illiterate. So here's the crooks, a who's who of two-bit thugs, sleepy Bill Burns, Bill Mahog, Abe Attell, who was a boxer back in the um, first, century, first decade of the 19th century. Now, Arthur Rothstein was too smart. He was the brain, after all. Uh, he may have been a major player. He may not have been a major player. We do know that Arthur Rothstein made a lot of money off of the fix in 1919. Uh, his involvement, never proven. Uh, the evidence suggests that Gendel and his co-conspirators, the other seven White Sox players, may have hatched a number of deals with a number of crime syndicates. That's a tell. Tell becomes a key part of this whole thing, a former boxer hanging around Chicago. Now, a tell claims they not only sold the series, but they sold it wherever they could get a buck. Bookies had previously had the Sox winning the World Series against the Cincinnati Reds by about three to one, the odds. The odds shifted after those in the quote unquote no began cashing, putting a lot of cash on the Cincinnati Reds. This was not exactly a secret. None of this was a, a, a secret. In fact, in baseball, 
nothing was a secret. People kind of knew, going back to the 1860s, what was going on. Now, the other thing that I found reading about this, that possibly there was so much money that went into the White Sox-Reds World Series because of World War I, that you couldn't necessarily go to the track because the horses that would be at the track were used during World War I in 1917 and 1918 over in Europe. So there was a shortage of horses, particularly quality horses. So some of the money went over to baseball. And here they are. The, fix these faces in your memory. Eight men charged with selling out baseball. But the funny thing all about that, everybody knew it, yet nobody did anything, and they stumbled upon it by accident. We're underway in Chicago, and Eddie Sicotti is on the mound for the home White Sox against the Cincinnati Reds, and the first batter that Sicotti faces, he hits. Allegedly, a signal hit by pitch that the game's on, we're going to do what you said we should do, fix the games in exchange for money. That was uncharacteristic of Sicotti. He had pretty good control. Chicago loses game one, nine to one. The New York Times, the New York Times in 1919 says, never before in the history of America's biggest spectacle. Sounds like Cosell, doesn't it? Spectacle? A biggest spectacle. Has a pennant winning club received such a disastrous drubbing in an opening game? They knew how to use words, the old sports writers in those days. They don't use those words today. Anyway, uh, the next day, more faulty play. Uh, Lefty Williams loses for the two, walks three batters in a row to help Cincinnati's cause. That's Christy Mathewson, the great pitcher for the New York Giants, who would ultimately succumb to tuberculosis because he went into World War I and worked in a chemical unit without any protection and eventually would get uh, tuberculosis, weakened lungs. He went to the Cincinnati Reds. He was the manager of the Cincinnati Reds in 16, 17, and 18 until he goes over to World War I. Christy Mathewson knows something is going on. Uh, the plot to throw the series, again, people knew. Players, sports writers, gamblers all hung out together. There was one guy, High Fullerton, of the Chicago Herald and Examiner, a Hearst newspaper, and Christy Mathewson. They had it all figured out. Fulton then eventually would go up to um, old, old Roman, Comiskey, and say, what's going on here? Is this, are these games fixed? And Comiskey says, nope. Uh, later it comes out that the players hadn't been paid by game five. The $100,000 isn't there, so game six and seven were on the level. One of the games in the first five games was pitched by Dickie Kerr. Dickie Kerr was not involved in any of the stuff. Now, it was best five of nine. The longer the series went, the more money the players were going to get. It used to be the players would get just a cut of whatever the receipts were, fixed amount, but all of a sudden they changed it for 1919 in baseball. Um, game eight comes around, the series is 4-3, Cincinnati at that point, and apparently one of the gamblers threatened to kill Williams and his wife if the White Sox won game eight.